See you were right on six minutes. Also. I'll leave you to Don without this question. No. That would have been too short. And, and I would like to recognize that, that um, Heather has donated towards um, a sign at US 82. Correct. So when we get the whole amount of money we need to get that pair up, we'll be putting the pair there. Um, that'll be our first set of signs. So, um, and we, you know, little by little are collecting money, and I'm the treasurer, and so I have all these different sort of, this is our account for brochures, this is our account for signs, this is our account for blah, 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 all these little bits of money I have to keep track of. So, um, our completely supported by our membership, um, so every dollar helps. So the reason that we're here is for y'all to learn about walls and um, to learn about some really specific um, water things. So science and practice, geology, erosion, and runoff. John Denisman and Don Timmy. Now I heard outside that Don Don was um, yielding his time to John, John completely. Much. Yeah. Okay. I'll do another one. I think it'd be better. I just okay. don't have time to do anything. So. Joe's husband, come talk to us. I need a computer. Okay, it's not here. I think it was already used. And so there's the open the file. Special DSU computer. And this is this? Yes. And do you want to play? Yes, please. Uh, let's go. Back at the top. Oh, because that's the computer screen. That's annoying. Uh, you see where play is? Start. Uh, it, it's directly in the middle of where the box is. Yeah, now. It is. But you can see it. Yeah. 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 Well, right there. It looks like it. I can see that. Good, good work. From right right beginning. Right. All the way to the left. Hit it again. Go to the from beginning. Yeah, from the beginning. Yeah. 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 From the yeah. beginning. Yeah. There you go. Ah, right. All right. A group effort. Oh. Okay. Oh. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Denison. I'm a geologist here. I teach at Honda State University uh, Physics, Astronomy, and Geosciences Department. I usually teach a lot of geology classes and also hydrology. I'm a hydrogeologist. I've uh, got a PhD in geology down in the University of Florida. I've been working on cars for a long time. Uh, started working on cars hydrogeology first, which turned out to be pretty complicated. Then I started working on karst geomorphology, doing a lot of sinkhole work and so forth. I'm going to try to explain briefly what we have here in Florida. This is about nothing about karst. Florida has nothing about you know, We've got limestone, so a lot of uh, dissolution of limestone. As a result of that, we have this karst feature. So let me briefly describe the importance of karst here because because of this cost, basically, I just want to, you know, refresh your memory, I guess. Everything is happening because of the dissolution of a rock called limestone. You got a rock, you got the rock is limestone, which consists of mineral called calcite. Calcite is soluble. As a result of that, the rock is dissolved, and you got these huge cave systems, sinkholes and everything, and that is good and bad. The good thing is it gives us a lot of storage for the water to be stored. Okay, so we end up with a, with a tremendous uh, capacity of uh, water storage and transmission. Hence, a very productive aquifer. One of the most productive aquifers in the world. The Florida aquifer is here. As you can see, it, it starts from like the whole Florida Peninsula all the way to Charleston, South Carolina. And it's thick. It's got a lot of room for water to be stored. So it's, it's an enormous aquifer. And to make everything even better, there is recharge. Okay, so if you know you can have this, you know, aquifer somewhere in a desert environment, if there is no recharge, it's not going to mean anything. 
but there is recharge here. There's this is a subtropical climate, so there's plenty of water, plenty of water to be stored, to be transmitted. So that's great. But the thing is, it's a cost aquifer, so it makes everything a little bit interesting. We need to talk about that. Interestingly, the karst aquifer of Florida is covered in many places. As you can see, all the brown areas are here covering the over, overburden, we call that, on top of the Florida aquifer. So it's not really exposed in many locations, except for this blue area, which happens to be right around, you know, Suwannee River Valley, right around here. We've got some opening here as well, but overall it's covered. Okay, and there's so much water, as I told you before, there's like, what, 27 of the 78 largest springs in North America coming from this aquifer. The flow is interesting because the flow actually takes place most of the time in conduit uh, conditions. So I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. So the thing is, it's covered with a thick overlying unit, which is called Halton Group. So there's a lot of impermeable rocks there. So I guess we should be OK as far as the superficial, you know, uh, the risk of being contaminated from superficial sources, because it's all covered, right? Well, it doesn't really work like that, because the cover material can be breached by sinkholes. I'll show you some examples of that. So we cannot really be you know, uh, safe, feel safe about uh, the contamination potential of, you know, flow of the aquifer is very, very susceptible, especially right here in this area. It happens to be the area where the sable trail is passing by, actually. Mm -hmm. So it's bare cost with a, about, I don't know, like 10 feet or maybe 20 feet of sand. That's it. It's uncovered karst aquifer. Okay, so when you look at it, the Florida aquifer, it actually has, like I said before, the covered part of it. This is the confined system, and then the uncovered part of it. And it turns out it's an extremely <coughs> interesting setting here. There are a lot of uh, disappearing streams around here. This is called Cody Scott, by the way. Cody Scott is, you know, by and large, it's almost right around here. It's actually the, almost the boundary between the confined and unconfined conditions. I don't want to go into too much details of that, but this, along this Cody Scott, we got a lot of disappearing streams, something that you can only see in karst regions, disappearing streams. A stream can disappear, okay? We just, uh, we were just talking about it. A lot of disappears, for example. With the Gucci disappears about 10 miles from here, uh, some, you know, especially during dry season. The whole Santa Fe River disappears in a place called the Lino Sin and comes back in a place called, you know, the River Rise. So this is a very interesting phenomenon that can only be seen only in karst areas. So why does it happen? Well, it happens because of the dissolution of limestone. Especially when the water comes from these highlands with no uh, with no calcite dissolution whatsoever. So it's chemically ag aggressive water. It's ready to dissolve. Okay, so as soon as it hits that bare limestone, there's going to be, you know, profound amount of, uh, you know, very, very important uh, feature of dissolution takes place right here along these dots. So we end up with this, especially, for example, in Valdosta area in South Georgia or, you know, anywhere except for Suwannee area, we got this superficial sands and clays. So, you know, this is the cover material that covers the aquifer, right? So we should be feeling good about it because this is basically protecting our Florida and aquifer from any kind of superficial contamination, presumably, right? But we never consider these sinks here. You know, every now and then these, you know, these uh, overlying units are breached by sinkholes. So we've got direct connection with the surface and the subsurface. That's another thing that is extremely uh, critical in karst area areas. We have 
direct connection between surface water and subsurface water. Okay, so in other words, what you dump in your sinkhole is what you drink in your aquifer. Or what you have as a contamination in your stream, any kind of contamination in your stream is directly transferred into the aquifer. So, uh, you know, like such a close connection between surface and subsurface water or groundwater, you cannot see that in any other type of aquifers. Only in karst you have this connection. A stream disappears with all the contaminants in it. Okay? And it's not only that, it disappears and then it moves fast. It moves fast with no natural filtration whatsoever. Because we're talking about these conduit flows, the flow that takes place along these you know, enlarged cavities, uh, you know, moving from one location to another location much faster with no infiltration whatsoever, like I said before. So a contaminant plume can move much faster. Okay, so what did we talk about? One, surface water, groundwater interaction is extremely close. It's very, and it happens in many karst areas. Another thing, water moves much faster with no natural filtration. Okay? And the, the other thing, probably, which is much more critical for, especially for modelers, is the flow does not really fit into our conventional flow models. The flow is not taking place in these micro pores of, you know, let's say sandstone and alluvium. It's not Darcian flow. It's not laminar flow. So we can easily model it. We can't really do that because the flow is flow is taking place in these enlarged cavities. Okay. The, the system is not. I, I need to talk about these. Uh, you know. Because just to give you the, the uniqueness about karst aquifers, the system is not homogeneous. In other words, you know, you got almost I don't know close to zero porosity here. You got infinite porosity here, right here, like within one meter. The system is so different. So it's, it's not homogeneous. Okay, it's not. It's not isotropic because you know, your, gra your permeability or transmissivity in this direction is infinite, but if you go this direction, it's like zero. It's not homogeneous, it's not isotropic. These are the assumptions that we make whenever we use these mud flow, for example, USGS groundwater flow modeling. Okay, we apply that model to here. Okay, you enter the values and you get you get some kind of a result, but it's it doesn't mean anything really because your system is extremely complicated. It is not homogeneous, it's not isotropic. The flow is not Darcyan flow. Okay? So that makes everything very complicated. That means you need to find some other models. So when you when you remove the overlying material, you know, be it some clays or just you know thin sand, this is what you see. Look at this, this, this environment. This is just amazing, incredible. And so this, this rock is basically dissolved by natural, naturally infiltrating water. Uh, it's slightly acidic water, just eats it away. I mean, can you say this is homogeneous and isotropic? I mean, it's, it is so different. Okay? These are called solution chimneys. There are some sinkholes. So we end up with sinkholes because of these dissolution values, dissolution processes. Some of them are notorious. This one is 1981 or so, uh, Winter Park sinkhole in Florida. It's, it's a collapse sinkhole, basically. Sometimes sinkholes are subsidence sinkholes that they, they gradually sink, so you can actually see. You can feel that it's sinking slowly over the years. Sometimes it can take, I believe, like in five minutes or so, this whole thing has collapsed in Winter Park. Now it's it turned into a recreational area, so there's a lake there and so forth. But, so living in karst is not easy. Uh, so, you know, because there's no ground stability either. And as you can see, most of the sinkholes, 
in South Florida are actually lakes, or most of the lakes that you see in Florida are basically sinkholes, some depressions. And the water table is actually groundwater table as well in many parts of Florida. So another thing that is so strange in karst aquifers is, you know, like the watershed, the concept of watershed. You know, like watershed for surface water, like this one, Fox River, for example. You can easily draw the boundaries of the watershed. You call that divides. You can divide them. Just take a topographic map and follow the ridges. High elevation, that's going to be your surface water. Drainage basin, also known as watershed, because you know, water flows downhill. It's that simple. So if you have any you know, rain drop here, it's going to flow this way. Rain drop here is going to go that way, outside. It's that simple. So, and in many cases, in any conventional aquifers like alluvium, sandstone, whatever, surface water divides or watersheds coincide with groundwater divides. Okay, so if you draw the surface water watershed, you can also safely assume that, okay, groundwater is also following the same divide because groundwater table also follows topography. Okay? You know, a little bit subdued, but it follows the topography as well. So that's great. But when you come to karst, it's not like that. You can never draw watersheds for springs or groundwater with karst by following topography because it defies topography because it's got connections along these, you know, different basins with conduits, with passages, with the passages, the cave systems and everything. So, like I said before, it's a, it's a different domain. There is no way you can draw these things and assume that karst aquifer has the same basis. So what do we do? In order to find out where our springs are related to or connected to, or in order to, to delineate these spring sheds or water sheds in karst, we have to rely on several things. One of them is if the, if the caves are large enough, we, we get some people you know, crazy enough to die into those caves. So they die and they map the cave and, and eventually sometimes they come out of the spring. You know, like, you know, they start from a sink and they come out of the spring and like, okay, so there's a, there's a connection there. So I guess we can delineate our watershed over there. We can do that. But in many cases, of course, the, the, the caves eventually get you know, smaller and smaller. So you cannot penetrate into it. Then you're going to have to use these dye tracing experiments. That's again a unique thing for karst aquifers. We inject some dye uh, and to a sinkhole, and you know, and observe where the dye is going to come out. You know, from potential, you know, springs for example. So that's that's one one of them in Sullivan Sink. This is uh, Leon Sink's area. The south of Tallahassee. So it's a very common technique to find out, to delineate watersheds in, uh, in car stockings. So this is it. I mean, look at this passage. This, this is the flow that we're talking about. Uh, tremendous amount of water, as you can see. Uh, it is fast and it is different. It's not, it's not the conventional aquifer. So the problems that you're facing with them is, of course, contamination. Okay, so we got a lot of non-point and also point contamination sources along these caves, for example, right? Because we've got land use practices that could be harmful for these springs, for the caves. So one of the things that I did, I'm not going to go over the whole thing, but I, I went, for example, and digitized all these caves. Where are they? Let me show you. And these are all the caves, which are also springs as well. And along these caves, around these caves, I wanted to see the land use distribution. Mm -hmm. So if there is, you know, are there some caves that we can actually, should be concerned about, we should be concerned about. So this is one of those, I don't know which cave is this, but here is, this, here is the land use around, I don't know, five kilometers, I guess. Okay, and uh, here is this one is Blue Springs, okay, Jackson County. 
there is a crop land and pasture land within that buffer. Okay, so we're talking about tremendous amount of you know potential potentially contaminated land use around these caves. Okay, so here is the table for all of them. So a big some some of them have large numbers, agriculture, urban for example, all these reds are flat. I flag that basically. So we should be concerned about the land use, of course. And like I said before, they are going to be contaminating those springs. That's what I've been doing so far. Uh, I just just recently finished the, the comparison between 2004 and 2014 uh, land uses between these two between these caves, along these caves. Okay, uh, what else are we doing at school? I just want to do some promotion here as well. So student projects, these are, you know, like I said, uh, as, you, as you may know, this is not a, we don't have a graduate school in geology. We got only you know, undergrads, so the only research students get to do is research, uh, senior thesis research, so which, you know, we try to get them as, you know, as involved as possible some of them, for example, does this, like this is one of the better examples of a senior thesis. Temple changes in Georgia wetland area. Somebody, for example, calculated what happened to wetlands. Uh, how many of them uh, yeah. How much wetlands were there between 1974 and 2001? And what did they get replaced with? What replaced wetlands? What happened to those wetlands? That was a pretty good GIS work. Uh, one of my students did. One of my students also, we had a lot of cave, uh, I'm sorry, borehole data. Uh, in those boreholes, there were some chemical data, like total hardness, vertical conductivity, and so forth. And we wanted to find out what's going on in Leon County. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Lawns County. So recharge flow, uh, the sinkholes and so forth. We try to see what is happening in that area. And recently, not, uh, well, probably last five, six years ago, I guess we got this ground penetrating radar uh, that we apply in many different locations to see what's going on with the cost. This is a uh, Chadwick Pond where with Lakuchi disappears somewhere here. So one of my students worked on this area, GPR, and you know, we basically got some of these sinks detected within the area using ground penetrating radar, GPR. Or just recently we obtained this electrical resistivity. That's another toy for us, so we're playing on that. Here is the chain. We actually, this was an interesting story because right now we are sitting on top of a cave. I can actually, you know, look down and see the cave entrance. So this is this is a perfect example of this. This whole thing is cave filled with groundwater in the Kuchi area. This is where the disappeared occurs. So we use these, and we can actually get some three D plots like these find out what's going on with the caves and so forth. Uh, I don't know if I covered everything, but in one day, this is all I came up with. If you have any questions, uh, I, I can do my best to answer. But we are living in a very fragile and susceptible, uh, you know, sensitive environment because of a car stock and it is very susceptible to contamination. We've got to be aware of that, I guess. Not many people know about it. And the question. Most of the lakes down near Lake Park, are those not also sinkholes? Those what again? Lake Park areas? The lakes around Lake yes. Park. Yes, yes, they are all sinkholes. Some of them are probably plugged up with sediment, yeah. but I don't know they were. That, that's, I mean, we're actually trying to work at Lake Louise at the University of Owens, which is also probably a 
part of it is single part of them. I mean, some of them have been uh, dug out by various developers as well. Um, and, uh, interstate dug out by the way. There is a single thing. Mm. Yes, Did you have a question? Yes. And it's probably hard to give a, um, a specific answer, but what flow rates within the conduits are you talking about? What, what would be a range for? Uh, the range is, is, is wide, very wide. I mean, the, the picture that I showed you is Wakala. That's the entrance to Wakala, and it is huge. Okay. Uh, I, I can't really give you an answer as to what the range is big. So if you had a contaminant introduced in a, in a fairly large conduit, yeah. it could travel miles per day? Well, not once. Not, uh, it's it's going to be much faster than conventional hockey force with micro porosity. It's going to be much faster than that. But uh, I, I remember uh, my friend Todd did this talking game right around here. Where is where is yeah? This is this is what call here. So from Tallahassee to, or Leon sinks to Wakala, it took about like 10 days, two weeks sometimes, for the dye to show up mm -hmm. in Wakala. Okay, around that time. Which is, that is fast or slow? Fast. That's fast, that's fast. That's, 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 that's pretty fast. Like fast. Speed. <laughs> well, remember when they put the dye in the sink, it came back up at the Swanee River, yeah. Of course, it's also controlled by the groundwater table. You know, the, we call that hot level, potential metric level, <coughs> how high it is. The season is important. Uh, you know, is there surface runoff as well, for example, things like that. But it's much, much faster. So it moves much faster. Can I make a comment on that, uh, John? Sure. We, yeah. we, we did a study in, in um, not in this area, but in another car story in Florida, south of Miami, in Homestead, which is basically you have the Biscayne Aquifer, yeah. which is similar in characteristics. Yeah. And we did some tracer studies, and we got travel times on the order of 50 to 100 meters a day um, under a relatively moderate hydraulic cat. So those, the systems are highly permeable, and obviously, so things can pretty quickly. I mean, typ typical groundwater transports are, you know, less than a meter per day. So, yeah. we're, you know, this is jet, jet propelled in terms of groundwater flow. Yeah. I guess those are the things we should focus on teaching the public or, yeah, I mean, telling the story of this aquifer. But this is not, this is different. This aquifer is different. This is very susceptible. What you dump is what you drink. It's that simple, you know. It's not. It's not like a conventional aquifer. When it as it flows, like in a sandstone aquifer, it is actually naturally filtered, and the flow is so slow. The plume may take a long time. The contaminant plume may take a long time to to reach your backyard. It's not like this. It's it's and it's directly related to your your creep, for example, is directly going into the aquifer. Something that never happens in other, you know, other geologies. So these are the things we need to focus on, telling these people. Because backyard, you know, uh, what is that? Single dumping is a common process. You know, everybody does that. Dump, dump all their trash to singles. Uh, I don't know if you ever seen. And that. they call them the go away holes. Yeah. <laughs> There's a documentary, pretty old actually. Uh, Walrus Journey, Florida's Underground Rivers, which was put out by uh, late uh, Wes Skiles, a cave diver, who died, open water diving, I guess. Uh, so he put out uh, this documentary, which actually so well you know, explains everything. Uh, because they start in a sink and they, they come out from the spring, for example. As they flow within the cave, they see barbecue grills, they see tires, they see batteries in the cave, way inside the cave, within the aquifer. 
and you know things like that. Whenever I show to my students, they they say like you know this, this was the most eye-opening documentary they ever seen because nobody can imagine that. They don't even imagine there's water in the rocks, and you know because more of in surface water, you know, ground water is out of sight, out of mind. Anyway. And it doesn't even take a sinkhole. And Hamilton County Department of Health has found coliform bacteria coming up in wells near the Lithicucci River. Now, that also, of course, says it's not coming from us. Yeah. And maybe they're right that, uh, okay, it could be coming from wildlife, it could be coming from cattle, it could be coming from bad septic tanks. And nobody really knows because there's not enough water quality testing along the river to find out, which is something we're trying to get Georgia and Florida those to do. The documentary would be interesting to watch. Yeah, we should get it screened. We should 